Wicked Cool. Feature alert. Hey there, podcast fans. Thanks for listening. Now, you can also reach out and send me a text message. On every episode at the top of the show notes, you'll see a link that says, send us a text message. Simply click it, write something super nice and sweet, and away we go. Also remember to please subscribe, share this podcast with a friend by telling them about it, and leave us a positive review, whether it's on Apple, Spotify, your favorite podcast streaming service, or even on our website at www.afraidofnothingpodcast.com. In a world where nothing is known, nothing is certain, reality is not real. Wake up! Be afraid of nothing. I'm Bob Heskey. Robert. The host with the ghost. This is my podcast, based on my paranormal documentary, Afraid of Nothing. Each episode, we talk to people who see life and the afterlife through a different lens. Join me. Who is this large man? And what's he doing in our bedroom? As we lift the veil and open our minds to see beyond our eyes lie. This is Afraid of Nothing. Bonnie Page, medium. You were in Lilydale when I was. We didn't see each other, and we're actually next-door neighbors, and we haven't seen each other yet. So this is the first time virtually that you and I have made a connection. Welcome to the show, Bonnie. Thanks, Bob. Thanks for having me. Yes, that's true. We ended up in the same place, but yet we're neighbors here. Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> uh, do you live in Winchington? I do, Winchington, Mass. Okay. I actually was born here when they actually had a hospital in the day. Winchington, for people that don't know, is Toy City. So there's this, like, there's the Murdoch Whitney House. Have you ever been there in Winchington, Massachusetts? I have, yes. Yep, I've done events there. Okay, so you know Don O'Neill? Have you met him? I do, yeah. Okay, cool. He was a guest on earlier. So, yeah, so if you go to Winchington, there's, like, this great, like, all these, like, toy horses, rocking horses, and a bunch of other great toys. It's known for that. (laughs) If anybody heads out to Winchington, you have to check out the Murdoch Whitney House. Don O'Neill does a great job. You can go and have events like you had there, Bonnie, and it's just a great place to visit. Mm Mm-hmm. Very historical. So it's, it is very historical around here. So Excellent. So yeah, I was going to start with this, but I might as well. Have you had any psychic experiences at the Murdoch Whitney House in Winchington? So when I say that I do a, a, an events, I'm actually a demonstrating medium, which means I go around and I demonstrate mediumship. I've been in hotels and the natural living expos coming up. Of course, during COVID, that all got shut down a little. But yes, I do in, in different clubs and different places. So I've actually been to that house and actually put on an event. So I sell tickets and people come to see me and, and it's really cool. It's, it's very nice in there. You know, everyone got to walk around and look at the other rooms as well. And to me, there's a lot of great energy in there. So I actually delivered messages from heaven in there. So when you go to a place like that, that's allegedly haunted, and I know it is haunted actually, when you do an event, you kind of will just block out any spirits that are there and you'll just deal with the audience pretty much and deal with messages from them, correct? So actually, I walk in the house and I say, hi, everybody, and that that everybody is kind of to the spirits that are in the house because I get a warm, loving feeling from them. Yeah. And then, yes, and then my messages are all directed from loved ones in heaven to the different audience members. And you are also going to be at the Old Mill Restaurant in Westminster, where I live, correct, in the fall? Yes, and I've done that many, many times. I love being at the Old Mill, and I'm in the big Westminster room there with all the windows and overlooks the water and the decks. And yeah, so I'm happy to be back there in October. Yeah, you just might see me as a uh, in the audience out there. I've been to some events there before. It's a great place. 
for our listeners to visualize in Westminster, there's this beautiful mill restaurant, water mill. It's got like a lake with some with some ducks and geese, and it's just amazingly <laughs> beautiful. It's just a great place. And the food is awesome, and they have the best breads, right, Bonnie? They have the best kind of sweet pastries that they give you for the dinner, too. So I love giving a dinner there. So with my event there, Bob, I actually, the ticket includes your dinner, which is a beautiful buffet. And it does include those homemade pecan rolls and homemade corn fritters that they do. So everyone has dinner and then they settle down and then I come out with the messages from heaven. So it's just kind of a nice cozy evening. That's awesome. So you are both a psychic and a medium. You're a psychic medium. Yeah. Can you just tell us what is the difference between a psychic and a medium and what it means when you're both of them? <laughs> so I call me psychic intuitive because being a psychic, you're going to perceive things that are around, energy that is around a person and get messages that way and give guidance that way to know what's going on in their lives. But I also tune into the spirit world to do that, to the divine. So I call me intuitive because I take it a step up. I love getting energy from people, but I also want that beautiful divine guidance that comes through. And then a medium is able to receive messages from loved ones in heaven. So they're on a different level and the psychic level is a little bit lower and, and of course, heaven's a little bit higher. So I know if I'm giving a mediumship reading where I need to go or if I'm giving a psychic reading where I need to go. And some people combine those. I have a reading called a little bit of everything and it's a little bit psychic, a little bit medium. And then it's um, some soul assessment work. So believe it or not, the energies are different, but I just need to know where I'm going next. So were you a psychic first and then evolved into a medium, evolved your capabilities? Or do you, you, do you remember that you had both when you first realized you had these, these capabilities? So I have to tell you, Bob, when I was little, I thought that every house was spiritual. I grew up in Fitzwilliam, New Hampshire, in an old one room, which used to be a schoolhouse for children. And my dad bought it that way and actually made it into a home. So very historical and lots of little children spirits in there. But my mom was a medium and my grandmother and my great grandmother. So when I was growing up, I could probably remember seeing spirit by the age of four, but they were kind of just like walking around my house, not me trying to see them, but me seeing them objectively outside of your third eye. So there's two ways to see spirit. One is in your third eye, which is subject. And on the outside, like with your own vision, that's objective. And I would just see spirits walking around. And I know that I would probably be standing there with my mouth open a little. And my mom, which I didn't know what a great medium she was at the time, she could actually tune in and see what I was seeing. And she would take the fear away of by saying, oh, that's just your aunt so-and-so, or that's one of your guides. And she could always just see who I was seeing. And so my gift wasn't pushed down in any way. It's not like my mom thought I had imaginary friends. She could actually see my friend that would from spirit that would come and visit me every day. So my gift was just kind of enhanced instead of, oh, yeah, that's nice, honey. You know, I had backup there. So I guess I'm, I'm actually very blessed that way. Yeah, I, I've talked to other mediums and one. She came from the Philippines, and her family actually took her to a witch doctor to try to get rid of the gift. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yes. No, I've heard stories. So so I, I always had this gift, I guess I'm trying to say, but I didn't really use it to help others by way of messages until probably the last 10 years. And I always really feel like God lets you live your life, and then when the timing is right, I actually heard his voice asking me to do more of this work. 
And you actually went to school for this in the UK. Oh, went, yeah. Yes. You went to the Arthur Finley College and then you studied under some great people. Yeah. Tell us about that a little bit, if you don't mind. So my mom was a great medium, but she never really had that training, which she didn't really, she didn't really need, but I felt like I wanted to get all the training I could. So when I started really seeing spirit people on an everyday thing, and they wanted to get messages to people, I wanted to know more. I wanted to take in all the knowledge that I could. The very first training I went was 2012 to the Omega Institute. And I went to International Mediumship Week with James Von Prague, Tony Stockwell, John Holland, and two other mediums. And it's a whole week's worth of training. And I was just kind of amazed, Bob, because anything that any of those teachers asked us to do, it came naturally to me. Wow. How big was the class and how did you do compared to the other people in the class? So it was over a hundred students. And I would say that when I'm in class, I kind of just sit back and I want to learn and take everything in. So it's it's not like I was kind of trying to stick out. That was like my first class. But it was kind of fun because I got put in this group with John Holland. And I think you must have heard of John Holland, right? I have. Yep. Yeah. And so he's like, if everybody come with me that knows they have this gift, but their confidence is like crap. So I said, oh, I think that's me. <laughs> so I, I went with him. And it's so funny because then I see James Von Prague on the side of us. And he's like got all the new beginning people. And he's like you know, just coddling them. And I'm thinking, what am I doing in my group? And then John Holland says, who's never gotten up and demonstrated? And I, I raised my hand. I'm in the back of the group and I raised my hand. He points to me and he goes, get up here. And I'm like, oh man, what did I get myself into? Never raise your oh. hand, Bonnie. Never raise oh, your hand. Oh man, Bob. So I walk up there and I start praying to God, dear God, please give me a spirit. Well, I got this grandmother that joined me and she gave me such evidence. Oh, I mean, it just spilled out of my mouth. She even gave me the name of her granddaughter that was another classmate that was in our group. I'll never forget it. And I just went blah, 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 blah. And the person was crying. And don't ask me how I got the guts, Bob. But I said to John, do you want to link in with me? And that that means, you know what wow. that means. Yeah, yeah. So he did. He linked in. It means in. different he things. Gave, but yes, that means, yes, I know what it means. For he, gave, <laughs> he gave a little more information. So he tuned into what I was seeing. And then he looked at me and he went like, what? And I went. I never did this before. So very, very thankful that um, spirit, I have learned, never let you down. They never, ever let you fall on your face. So even though I was brand new at doing that, I think they even kicked it up a notch more. Yeah. And look, that's only like nine years ago. And if someone goes to your website, they see all the books that you've written and yeah. you do two newspaper columns, which we'll get into a little bit later, yeah. but that's... You just really threw yourself into it, didn't you? I really did because it became my passion. When you love what you're doing and it's your passion, you can't almost stop yourself from doing it. You wake up thinking about it. And it's all about really about being in service to spirit. You want to get better and better and better at it. And I always say that intuitive muscle that mediumship muscle, it really is like going to the gym. If you want to make your muscles bigger, you you go and work them out, right? So to me, that's what training is for. And you always pick up something a little new from either from a teacher or another student. So it so you just abundance of learning when you go for training. So one of the places where you go to learn, and this is actually this is going to be part of a little mini series on my on my podcast about Lily Dale. So yeah. you were at Lily Dale about a week or so ago, and it wasn't your first time. For those listeners who are kind of listening in, are like Lily Dale, what's that? How would you describe it? <gasps> that is just if you love everything spiritual, you need to go to Lily Dale because that's a whole spiritualist town, and I've been there 
four or five years and been there a couple other times because it's just so magical. But I ended up just going to see James von Prague doing a demonstration. And I ended up having a reading there myself because believe it or not, us mediums like to have our mom and dads and our loved ones come through sometimes too. So I can I ask a quick, quick question before that? Yes. I've heard from other mediums that they can't give themselves a reading. You have to go to someone else. Is that correct? So sometimes if my mom and dad want to get something through to me, I can hear them clear as day, but I don't always have that link to them. And I can tell you that's because we're meant to be on our own journey and make up our own minds. But sometimes, Bob, if they need to get a message to me, wow, I can see their faces. I can hear their voices but not always like a mediumship message that you get from a medium. Okay, great. And, and sorry, you were talking about your, you went and saw a medium in Lilydale and, and, and how was it? It was great. And she was really sweet. Uh, her name's Shelly Wilson and she's still teaching there as well. And I had a reading and she goes, wow, you're meant to be a teacher of this. And she told me actually how to apply to Lilydale. And I came home and I applied and they accepted me. And I've been teaching there ever since. Well, last year, I didn't even actually apply. They called me up and said, Bonnie, will you come teach two classes? And I said, sure. You can actually buy a house down there, right? The secret of buying a house in Lilydale is, however, you need to be a medium or a healer to live there. Yep. So Lilydale is this whole spiritualist town that they have their own healing temple. They have their own museums, their own library, their own churches. Inspiration stump. Yeah, inspiration stump, and then the the temple is there. Yep. And it's just really magical because if you love everything spiritual, you can walk from house to house and have a reading and a, another reading or a healing or go watch um, mediums give messages and there's registered mediums and there's visiting mediums. So if you love everything spiritual, that is the place to go. I went there. We talked offline when we were talking about interviewing you. I, I mentioned my biggest disappointment uh, a couple of weeks ago was that the healing temple was only meditation. They usually on the healing they have, they put hands on you and it's great. For myself, I went down just to kind of unplug from society. I went down for a week. I got, I know I, I went to bed early. I got up when I wanted to for the whole week there. There's no TV. I had maybe two drinks, you know, if I went off campus. <laughs> I didn't really realize it as much as I left, but I didn't really have a toxic thought. So that's how it affects someone like me, who's not a psychic or a medium. Theoretically, it's on an energy vortex, I think, if that's what they call it. And it just gives you a different, oh, I guess it helps you vibrate higher. And so you're not thinking of the toxic stuff or the negative stuff that you usually think about when you're not there. So for me, it was a week to unwind. And I'm curious, do you get that when you step on the campus? Do you feel a difference or is it over time? Maybe you just feel a little better there. No, I I think I think anyone that parks in the parking lot and gets out there's a there's a whole different feeling there. People are rocking in rocking chairs and the lakes right there and there's just so much to offer. Just just walking around, you know, you can go on those ghost hunts. I haven't gone on a ghost hunt. Ah, uh, you need to. You need to. That's one of my interviews. Great guy. I heard from you that you need to, um, but there's the fairy trail and it's just, it's very peaceful there. So I have to tell you, Bob, yeah. the first time I was there, those little houses, because there there's a lot of little houses on each street and there was a couple for sale and I came home that first week and I'm like, oh, I need to have one of those. And my husband's like, you can't leave me half of the year to go away. Right. But they were only around $25,000 and now way high. Well, I think they're around like 125, 150, right? I mean, they're still somewhat, you know, if you can afford a second vacation house, maybe. You know? I guess. But, but the other thing is that they do want you to be a healer or a medium. And you've got to be involved in stuff. You got They have an agenda and they expect their mediums to be involved, look at readings, at Inspiration Stump or at the Healing Temple or whatever. So it is kind of a time commitment too, right? It is. It is. 
you mentioned the fairy trails. Look, I, I went there and I actually uh, talked to a couple of psychics there and they were very big on, they actually have a, I forget what they called it, but there was some type of degree they had in fairies <laughs> and fairies are a big thing in Lilydale. And it, it seems like something you'd roll your eyes at, but it's uh it's kind of like, you know, akin to angels, but not as powerful. It's a different type of a tiny pixie entity, but they're real there. And you want to share your thoughts on fairies? Yeah, so they're real everywhere, Bob. I I went and did this meditation one day a few years ago now in this man's hut. He's he's a shaman and he does um, meditations and it, and it was all about the woods and nature, like shamanism is. But that night was amazing for me because I, I see angels anyway. I see them almost daily. But I had never at that point seen fairies. And it opened me up to all of these fairies coming to me. And they are so cute. And they're so loud. And they're like joy angels. So they're smaller. And they're faster. And they make a little noise like la, 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 la. Oh man, I can't believe these are real. But the the fairies are very much real. And they're so sweet. And they just they they live in the woods and the flowers and, and the bushes and the shrubs. Like they're the elemental. So they're very sweet. I even have seen gnomes. So and I have to tell you one thing, Bob. I another medium that I know was there teaching, um, Nancy Smith, and we're we're friends. And we ended up there the same week, which is great. But she went on that fairy trail and she saw fairies for the very first time and she was texting me like there was no tomorrow. Yeah, I gotta go down there and actually take pictures at night. When I went on the ghost walk, they didn't have a lot of uh, stuff at Inspiration Stump the week I was there. There were a lot of mosquitoes. It was supposed to be wet and rainy. But on Inspiration Stump, at the ghost walk, you end up, you, it's well worth the money. It's like two and a half hours, and it's got a lot of history baked into it. You end up at Inspiration Stump, and you're quiet, and you kind of meditate for a little bit. Mm-hmm. And no mosquitoes. <laughs> I mean, like, there's none when we were there. Well, that's kind of amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it really was. And he mentioned, he says, you won't, you won't experience mosquitoes when we're at this part of the, at the end of the ghost walk. And we didn't. And it was like, oh, my God. Wow. So the spiritual world has to take care of that for you, I yeah, guess. Yeah, yeah. So that was, I was, and I saw kind of at the corner of my eye, I saw like this light thing coming from the woods. And I thought, <gasps> does someone have their phone on? Or when I, I couldn't, you know, I wasn't sure, but I saw like this. And I'm thinking to myself, is it, you always think, mom? Is it, is that the so only it's person? Spirit lights. Yeah. Yeah. Or is it yeah. Indian? I felt Native American. And I, I, I'll well, throw it again. Okay. That's a spirit light, too. So that would have been one of your guides. Wow. Yeah. That'd be cool because. What's also unique about Lilydale, and I have one question about fairies I want to come back to, but Lilydale, it does have like a Native American presence, I believe, at least I've been told. Yeah, they do drummings and everything. Yeah, but even like a spirit presence there a little bit, I Mm -hmm. think. And what's unique about that area is you go to Massachusetts, there's King Philip's War, it's all bloodied, and it's a battles, and like the Conjuring House I've been to in Burrisville, Rhode Island, it's, or Harrisville, or Burrisville, one of those two, Uh you know, psychics get out, or or mediums, and they step on the ground, like, oh my god, (laughs) the ground here is just just mired in negative stuff. Even the Hinsdale House in upstate New York, but where Lilydale is, none of that bad mojo or none of that bad vibes happen. So it's very positive. So you don't get any of that. So I found that kind of interesting. So I have to tell you, Bob, I don't know if you've noticed yet or not, but I stay on the higher side of spiritual work yep. <laughs> um, for a reason, because I'm trying to really give guidance to people. And I actually heard from the spirit world, separate yourself. So I don't do the scary stuff. I stay away from anything that's not in the light or not really positive. But I have to tell you, I stayed on the third floor of the Maplewood Hotel that's in Lily. Yep. And I felt it was very comfortable. And then I taught my class that night, come meet your guides. And one of the, the helpers said to me, oh, you're on the third floor. And I'm like, yes. And then I even got a little like, what, what? Right. Yeah. But it was so funny because I went up to my room that night and I walked the hall a little and there was a picture of sitting bull and he is one of my guides he actually introduced himself to me a few years ago 
Wow. And I actually called my my dad. Do you know who Sitting Bull is? Of course I do, Body. And I I had heard his name, but I was just amazed he was able to give me his whole name. So I was a little afraid on the third floor, but then I found Sitting Bull's picture and I'm like, oh, he's just telling me, Bonnie, if I'm here, who's going to bother you? Yeah, I'm going to cover this in another episode, but that Maplewood Hotel, it's what you call hung architecture. One thing you find out if you go on the ghost walk, Bonnie, is that originally it was a stable. So up at the very top, the original first floor was a stable. Mm-hmm. And then when they added the first floor, they raised the stable and put the first floor under it. So if you're on the third floor, you were originally on the first floor. And mm-hmm. then when they put another floor, same thing. They kept lifting it up. And so the other two stories were added to it. Mm-hmm. Now, what you didn't hear, but what you could have heard on the third floor is horse hoofs and a lot of like, you know, horse sounds. A lot of people hear that on the third floor because there's a stable up above them. And that would have been okay because I've been raised with horses and my dad grew up with horses. And my dad passed at 93 just three years ago now. But I used to tell him because he was raised with horses. He, he always had a stable full of horses. And I said, Dad, when you get to heaven, you get all your horses back. And after he passed, in my third eye, it opened up, and here's a herd of horses coming towards me. Wow. (laughs) I know. Isn't that cool? Yeah. I'm happy. So that was Dad's way of saying, honey, you were right. I got got all my horses back. Yeah, that's great. In regards to Lilydale, it's weird. It's a hamlet of like 40-plus mediums, and they talk to the dead. There's not a lot of hauntings there. You don't get a lot of like ghost or a residual energy too much. Mostly it's just kind of the mediums who talk to the, you know, to the family and to spirit. There's not a lot of the ghosts that are kind of like stuck in, in this realm. At least that's what I've been told. I don't know if that's what you picked up. Yeah, no, I always, I feel like what you just said. Yeah. I really feel like people, the, the mediums at Lilydale, whether they're visiting or, or whether they are the registered mediums, that they really are there to serve the people that come to Lilydale and, you know, hopefully heal some hearts along the way. Yeah. And the people are very nice that go there. You don't see like bar fights or, <laughs> or get bad looks or anything. It's just like a lot of nice people, you know. Well, probably because there's no bars and there's no alcohol. Yeah, yeah there you go. <laughs> That'll solve a lot of problems. Sorry. I, <laughs> I know. It's, it's so funny. You said that about, I had that, intu- I'm not an intuitive, but I had that feeling about you that you didn't kind of go to dark places or you didn't like do stuff. I don't. I don't. And I've talked to other people like that as well. And it's like, no, they just, which, hey, you can't blame them. It's like, I just go into the light. Why deal with the dark? I don't want to deal. I want to just go into the light and have good feelings. Yeah, no. I stay far away from anything that isn't just just a pure light, you know, all for your highest and greatest good. So we're going to go into some of your books and your and your uh, newspaper columns in a, in a second. I, one more question about fairies. <laughs> yeah, I just kind of like because I never took them seriously. Oh it's my like, gosh, and then I, they're so cute. Yeah, I never. It's going to come back to haunt oh. me. Trust me. But what do they do? I mean, angels like help humans. Fairies are they just kind of what is their purpose, or are they just kind of a separate entity that does their own thing and helps the woodlands and the animals? Yeah, so they're kind of called like the joy angels, right? Because they're there to bring joy into your life. And that's why I think like they're faster and they're smaller and they're they're cuter. They're just like flying around you. And, and I know this is hard to believe, Bob, but I'm going to tell you on air and I don't share it with everyone. But one night when I was in that, you know, between stage, here comes this little fairy and she's flying closer and closer and closer to me and she gets up to me and she and she just like sprinkles that fairy dust on me and now anybody that's not spiritual might go oh my god really like that's disney but this is what this little fairy did to me and i remember saying to her oh that's the nicest thing anyone's ever done for me because it was so so sweet. And and she really did that. I didn't even know what this little fairy was doing. And here's all this like fairy dust coming at you. So I always say, yeah, it is kind of Disney because someone way back then must have been seeing fairies and what they can do. Are fairies spirits? Do they go to the afterlife or are they just kind of here on earth to be visible to us? Do they go back and forth? Huh. I, I'm... 
I'm not sure of that question. I know that they're called elementals. So if you love flowers, you know, the little joy angels, which are the fairies are near you. Um, do they go to heaven? Well, I, I don't think they're stuck here because I don't believe that we, even as people, you know that we visit heaven at night, correct? We we visit. No, no. Actually, some of my guests have said that, but I didn't really know that per se. So you might want to share that with our audience. That would be great to hear. So I tell people all the time, and this this is going to be funny because the spiritual world knows everything that happens be, kind of before we do it. They know the big picture. So this question is kind of funny. So I tell everybody that, and, and we have this silver cord on us going up to heaven. And at night, we really do go up there and visit. I found myself many times in one room or the other in heaven. And I always say, oh, I'm so nosy that I go to bed at night and I go, oh, beam me up. Like, I want to see something new. So I've seen my mom getting her, the first day she was in heaven, getting shown around. I I saw my dad getting his life review. And they. I believe that they show me these things, Bob, because I do teach about them. But our souls very much just go right up to heaven. I found myself in heaven at my family's log cabin with my mom and all our family just chatting away like it's nothing. And so I have to tell you this. She might kill me, but I'm going to tell you. So I taught my class on come meet your guides. And I was telling everyone the story like we really do go to heaven. And so if you've ever been laying in bed, Bob, and all of a sudden you 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 get jilted a little, that's your soul coming back into your body and it's not hitting just right. So a lot of people can relate to that. Oh yeah, I have that happen. I have that happen. And I go, you've been visiting heaven. But I went back to my room that night and my friend that was staying with me, my my assistant, she's like a little daughter to me. We had twin beds and she's over there in that bed and I'm in my twin bed. And I happened to look over and I actually saw her soul go one, two, three into heaven. Wow. Never saw that before. I actually was a little freaked out. I'm like, oh my God, is she breathing? But because I teach and I like to see and know for sure what I'm teaching, I got to witness that. But it was so kind of freaky, Bob. Like it wasn't just a light of her soul. It was like her whole body lifting like one, two, three in slow motion. I had kind of a weird experience, but I thought it was something else. (laughs) What did you have, Bob? Well, yeah, but it might be a little darkness, though, Bonnie. So (laughs) I I did a documentary, Afraid of Nothing, right? So I went and visited some haunted places like the S.K. Pierce Victorian House. And I had a friend in Salem who runs the Magic Parlor, and they had a Ouija board that was supposed to be uh, possessed by seven demons. So I bought that board. Uh, I put it in my car. I got some weird EVPs. And then I eventually got a shaman, and he depossessed the board. Okay. But anyway, so I did get some weird EVPs in the car, but also one night I'm facing my ex-wife in bed. She's asleep. And I thought I was drifting off to sleep. And I literally felt my chest rip open. You know, like you push in on your chest. It was like the other way. It was like opening up Uh and like a breathless thing. Something kind of went out of me. So, and then I kind of like, did that just happen? I didn't know. I thought first, did my soul leave me? Was there a dark attachment? I mean, then someone else, I asked someone else and they said, no, no. Every night we go to bed, we kind of leave our body and we go to heaven. Yeah. yeah. And I'm like, really? Because I haven't experienced that. So, Bob, a lot of times, you know, I give readings constantly. That's what I do. I'm a full-time medium, right? But I get these people that come and the person comes through and I go, oh, so-and-so is here. They have a big smile on their face. They're chatting away. I'm telling them everything. And I have had people say to me, why are they so happy and I'm not? They remember that we visit them and that they've been visiting you daily. It's just we don't remember. One of the guests I had on a couple episodes ago, he wrote a book on multiple heavens. And he kind of travels. He taught someone that taught him to travel, astral travel, 
And he was shocked that there were, based on religion, there were different types of heavens. Just like in the world, there's different flavors of the world, that there are different portals or different parts of heaven, which is, Mm -hmm. I hadn't thought about that, but that episode was really popular. And I can kind of see that in heaven, there are probably different iterations of it. Do you think that heaven is one kind of consistent place? Do you think it's a bunch of different type of realities based on who's there? So I believe that we are creating our own heaven. I believe that our version of heaven is the way that we live right now. So that could very much be because my version of heaven wouldn't be probably like somebody else's, especially if they're from a different country with different rituals and things, right? So yeah. So when I go to heaven, I, lo- I love it because I can see people that look just like you and I. I can see what they have on. I can see their hairdo. I can see the whole kit and caboodle. But one night, it was a night before an event. And I said, oh, I hope, you know, I hope I get a nice big crowd. And that night they brought me up and there was these white light souls lining up already to come to the event. And they showed me that. (laughs) So we really are souls in heaven. But I went back to going, okay, can I see what you look like when you were here? Yeah. But we really are one consciousness. I I have seen that another time visiting heaven. Like, so you know what an orb looks like, a ball of light, right, Bob? Yep, yep. So I, I went to heaven and there's all these just balls of light and they, but they were all really close, but you could tell that they were different, right? Yeah. Different souls. And then some of them, you could see them trying to talk to me and one reached out his hand and waved. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, I know. I see freaky things. It's a good thing that I I have that spiritual family. No, it, yeah, it's great. It's like I've, you know, I'm close to sixty episodes now, so I've kind of heard a lot of different things like this, which is which is really good. I mean, I started on this journey because my mom got Alzheimer's. I saw her in a nursing home. I said she didn't recognize me. I used to be the apple of her eye. Mm-hmm. I, I had this this sense of. First, I was always afraid of life or the afterlife. I'm like, is there even a purpose if your own mother doesn't even recognize you? So I did this documentary called Afraid of Nothing, which was like half the people in the world think there's no afterlife. The other people think there is, or there's nothing to fear. And then I had that even third iteration where it's like, is life even have any meaning if someone that could be your mother doesn't even recognize you at the end of her life? But it also drove me to make a movie because I thought I could be in this nursing home in 25 years with Alzheimer's too and not left anything behind. So I made a movie, all right? And then I did the podcast after it. So it kind of put me on that journey, you know? So that uh-huh. led me there. And everywhere I go places, you know, my father's still alive, but she will come through. Like at Lilydale, I was once at the assembly hall or the auditorium or whatever. And, you know, the mediums come out and they give messages. And then uh, one said, you, you right there. There's someone, she's talking very fast. She's saying, that guy's a great guy. He's the best guy, <laughs> you know, which is like exactly what my mother was saying. Yeah. So, yeah, there's a couple times that happened when I was there about messages. Aww. So, yeah, it's it's good stuff, man. I really, I, I felt at the time when she passed, it wasn't anything, it was cold and it was clinical, you know. It was like seven days of her struggling for every breath, no food, getting her, her lips, moisture on her lips and stuff. It was hard to watch. And I was like, God, what is the point? Very hard to watch. It's very hard to watch. It's it's hard on us, Bob, but their souls kind of are above their body and kind of looking down at everything. So I'm even told that they don't even feel the pain of dying. Like that's taken away from them. So it's very hard on us to watch. It absolutely is. And that's what traumatizes a lot of people watching their loved ones in this state. But when these lovely spirits come through to me, they're like, tell her I couldn't talk at the time, but I heard everything she said. And I knew everything that was going on. So even people like your your mom, even if it doesn't look like they know what's going on, their soul knows. One of the most enlightening things I think I had on the show was I talked to a pet psychic one. Yeah, no, no, really. Animal communication is huge. And every animal is a soul. I I wish everyone would look at them like that. Yep. No, that's his point. But what he made a point was very interesting. It's like the difference between, for example, like dogs and or even cats or, you know, let's just take dogs. Dogs and humans is when they're dying and it's time to go, they see like the green field and they run to it and they're good. 
when humans are passing, we're clinging to mortality and materialism and everything, and we don't want to go. It's the difference between your pet and you. When it comes their time to let go of the pain, they will jump to that green field and then romp around and have a great time. And it's an easier transition, I guess, is my point. A lot of times, theoretically, based on him, and I thought it made sense, for your pets than it is for humans when you're when a loved one dies because they're clinging to the family and to the material stuff. Meanwhile, your pet is like, ooh, field, go. You know, it's, it's just kind of different. Well, the thing is, you know, animals, dogs, cat, all animals, you know, they come into your life for a reason and they're really unconditional love. And they have a soul's purpose as well. So if you needed that dog to be there for you during different times in your life, those pets still come through and they still want to remind their their human here, oh, I was here during this time and this time. So they can come through just as easy as a, a human spirit can. Yeah. You need to know what to look for though, Bonnie, right? So you need to see the signs and that that's kind of what he helps a lot of people with. I think Bob... What a nice way to look at it is heaven is our home. We came from heaven. That's where we're all going to go back to our home. And here on earth, this is our schoolroom. So we're here to learn those life lessons. And we're here to have those hard times. And when we do, you know, those life's challenges, when we do have those and we grow with them, our soul is allowed to expand and grow as well. So you might have learned a little more compassion or a little more sympathy. I mean, there are hard things in life that are hard to watch, but then it makes us a better person, a better soul, someone able to understand someone else. Yeah, totally. And so, and then at the end of our life, we're like, okay, it's time to go home where it's not hard and it's not challenging. But then you're there for a while and you come back down. <laughs> so you just, uh, you just answered my next question before we talk about your books is uh, when you're in Lilydale, spiritualist, half of them believe in reincarnation and the other half don't. I was going to ask you which side of the fence you fall on. Sounds like you're definitely a believer in reincarnation, correct? I can tell you I'm... A hundred percent sure that we reincarnate because I've been shown many times, even people that have come back down have told me where they're going to be or what they're doing or what family they're in. And sometimes it's hard to know that information exactly. But again, I believe I'm shown. So I am here to teach that reincarnation is very, very real. And the fun thing, Bob, is if you've never done a meditation and lived through your past lives, that's something to do because you'll see yourself in past lives and then there'll be no doubt. So I would really, you know, if it's a religious thing that people don't believe they're reincarnated, that's fine. But if you really want to see, go to someone that can take you through your past lives. And it's very, very interesting. And usually you learn a lot about you in this lifetime. So if you have a hang up in this lifetime, like you're afraid to go swimming or something like that, you could have drowned in your last lifetime. So if you're insecure, like, you know, a lot of us can be with certain things, you could find out why that this traveled with you. Because we're still that same soul. But there's just little pieces of different lifetimes in that soul. I hear that we kind of the same persona or personality for the large part. I do hope like I'm a better athlete in my next life or other things are better. Or, you know, yeah, I, just, I kind of just hope some things are better. I asked God, how come I couldn't be a rock star? And I, I really did hear back. He said, that's a hard life. So I said, okay, I'll take your word for it. But it does look fun to me. Well, you're a rock star on the paranormal, right? (laughs) (laughs) So let's talk about your books. Let's let's wrap up and talk about your books and kind of some of the services that you have. Two of your books are Ask the Medium Next Door and Ask the Psychic Medium. Want to tell us about those and where they can get them? So they are on Amazon and Barnes & Noble. They're also on my website now. But I started writing columns first. So I've been writing four years now for the Sentinel and Enterprise. And then they put my column in the Lowell Sun. And then it just went into a third paper, the Neshoba Valley Voice. But I took some of those best 
columns that I really love. And I made it into Ask the Psychic, God Asked, I Listened. And it tells a little bit about what I told you about growing up being a medium and then hearing the voice of God asking me to do more of this work. You want to know about everything spiritual that's in that book. And then the second book was actually published. They're both through um, Balboa Press, which is a division of Hay House. But the second book was published during COVID. And it's more about real life experiences that I had growing up, like seeing my dog when I was 12 years old. I had gone to school and Lucky had gotten hit in the road and passed away while I was at school. And it tells the story of how I was alone in the house for a few minutes. And there appears Lucky sitting by the fireplace in my family home and giving me a big smile and waving his tail and letting me run all the way up to him. And then poof, he was gone. But when I turned around in the other room was all of these newly chewed toys that my mom had put away um, so that so it wouldn't make me sad. So there's more of these stories in in that book. So Ask the Psychic Medium is more of your kind of stories from your column and Ask the Medium Next Door is more your personal type of stories. Is that correct? Well, yeah, infused with more personal stories. But I always even in the in my column, I like to give it a human feel. So you get a lot of me in there, no matter what, Bob. That's good. It's always a good thing. <laughs> so mediums, I've talked to mediums before, and a lot of them say, look, in, in one ear and out the other, we forget we deal with so many people. It's almost good you're documenting this stuff. Is there one favorite story that always makes you smile or has always been with you out of your books or your columns that you just want to share a, a quick one? Let's see. So I I give readings these past 10 years. And after you're done the reading, a few minutes later, you don't even remember what's come through. I believe it's not how many people we see, but that it's taken away, if that makes sense. Yeah. However, I did write about a couple kind of gut-wrenching, they do stay with you. I had a couple come to see me probably just four years ago. And the dad wasn't a believer at all. So I had a mom and a dad, and it was the mom that was bringing the dad. And I knew nothing except that they wanted to speak to their son. So I always close my eyes for just a second so I can get a really good look. And I started identifying the son, and I knew his age, and he was 18. And then he's just he just was like, had such a strong message for his dad. Dad, it's not your fault. I went out. You didn't want me to. He showed me like the dad not letting him out the front door and them arguing, butting heads. And and then the kid says, but I went out anyway, but my dad is holding it inside. And when I relayed this to the dad, what had happened is the kid wanted to go out, right? He's 18. It was raining. The, the kid had showed me it was raining. My dad doesn't want me to drive in the rain, but I went anyway. And they had this big fight, Bob. And then the son goes for that drive anyway. He got out the door, you know, like an 18-year-old would. And got out the door, went for a ride, and died in the accident. And so when that dad, he just sat there listening to everything his son was saying, and these tears were just pouring down his face, it was like he needed to hear that. He needed to hear from his son again. I mean, I think the way he hugged me after, that always stuck in my head. So I don't forget that reading. Well, I tell you, that's a great story to remember. I mean, a lot of times grieving parents, uh, those are the ones that need the most comfort. And so to help someone at a time like that, especially men who keep it in or like a father, like maybe this guy that keeps it in, you probably did save his life. (laughs) He may not have even have known it at the time. And then one other column that is in my book, and I call it the saddest reading, this lady that had been reading my columns, which, which I didn't know, but she called for a reading. She was actually on hospice dying, Bob. Ugh. And she calls me and she, she doesn't tell me that at first. She just says, can you tell me who's around me? 
And so, you know, I, I, I search the spirit world and I see this man and this husband's coming through and he's telling me, I'm right with you. I got your hand. I'm standing next to the bed with you. La, 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 la. And he goes on and on and on and on. And I don't know what's happening. Right. And then and after I gave delivered the whole message, she said, thank you, Bonnie. She said, I'm on hospice and I'm about to die, but I want to I just wanted to make sure somebody was there for me. And she goes, and I love you. Uh, And I was like, oh, my God. I got off the phone, Bob, and I cried like a baby. Wow. Yeah. Well, it's good to document those stories. It's a good thing that you do that. So there's a purpose in those columns. So that's great. Now you can remember them dearly, almost if you wanted to. So that's, that's awesome. It just lets people know that they're not alone, right? Your website is www.bonniepagemedium.com. What type of person should seek you out? I really do love to help people connect with their loved ones. That's my main passion. Also, people that really want some guidance, not a fortune teller, but some guidance in their life. Because I, I am a spiritual life coach certified. I am a minister in the state of Massachusetts. I've taken spiritual classes. I'm really there to help people. So someone that really wants guidance in their life or reaching their loved ones, that's what I specialize in. Well, it's sorely needed, especially after the past year or so that we've gone through some stuff that have affected people emotionally. So thank you, Bonnie, for your time today and for your your stories and sharing your stuff. I mean, you really are of of service, and I look forward to hearing how I'm actually probably going to go to your your Westminster thing in, in October. So I look forward to seeing the demonstrating medium in person. Yeah, I would love it. Thank you for being on the show. Thank you for having me, Bob. You've been listening to the Afraid of Nothing podcast. Please subscribe and like us on Facebook. Until next time, stay scared. Hey, you're still here? Great. Then why not listen to another episode? Visit afraidofnothingpodcast.com to peruse all the shows. That's afraidofnothingpodcast.com. And while you're there, click the coffee cup icon to buy me a coffee and leave a review. I'll give you a shout out in an upcoming episode. And the world will know how swell you are.